I'll be quite short with my uh, mm. talk. The the whole idea that uh, you know there is a, a huge amount of of approaches in terms of compute um, on top of decentralized data, and uh, um, I think what we put most attention to is um, we, we started from this like okay we have IPFS as a great decentralization uh, for data and uh, the first idea is now we don't need any backends like we don't need clouds anymore right like we can build everything on front end but then we have all this complexity on the front end um, and uh, we basically start thinking okay well, what can we really move somewhere to performant nodes on the backend um, and make sure that you know we have data indexing, caching, and uh, some APIs and stuff because we cannot really um, have enough performance uh, to have decent UX on the front end. Um, and uh, uh, we were thinking a lot about this topic, and uh, um, the whole idea here is to have the as universal as possible runtime that potentially like as cool as uh, lambdas. Uh, and like automatically scalable, so you can just put any code there and like it's magically works and you don't need to think about it and it can work on any device. So, and also like it's open from the uh, nodes perspective. So like it's the same as anyone can run the IPFS node, anyone can, should be run Fluence node who would do um, this computation. Um, and um, uh, I know I have like these slides I have here, they are like quite high level and pretty obvious stuff. But we kind of think about a lot of this platform risk and uh, um, the composability of software in general, like a Web2 problem, if I have API and, and, and it runs on some server and uh, probably uh, like the data probably sits also in centralized database, but even if it doesn't sit in centralized database, uh, someone still runs API on some server. Uh, so if other applications use this API to build their, their stuff, uh, they have this dependency, and this dependency controlled by API, API creator and by whoever runs this API on their server. So they can cut off the uh, the access, which is pretty bad. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like this this slides from from blockchain context, but like a lot of companies in blockchain space right now, uh, they take this open um, database of blockchain data and index it and, and kind of convert it into uh, some custom queryable databases and uh, package it as APIs, like NFT APIs, like OpenSea, uh, like some wallet APIs and stuff like that. And then uh, other people, like they kind of try to bring other people to build on top of their HTTP Web2 APIs uh, to have uh, better products for users. And the problem is like the data is decentralized, it's there, it's, it's on the blockchain nodes, but these this APIs are centralized and no one can like re-host them or like rerun them. Or, like, and and uh, basically we get back to, uh, at this layer, we get back to Web2 world. We don't, we don't solve the, the platform risk uh, from this perspective. Um, so we are trying to kind of solve this issue um, at the highest level and uh, uh, we think that uh, there is a like there should be a network that just allows you to deploy any, any computation, run it, and uh, to have like if you need verification for the computation, you should be able to do it. If you don't need, you sh you should be able to avoid it. Uh, so it's sort of like a um, hybrid trust model for the computation, uh, and it should be like much more relaxed than you have um, than constraints you have on chain. Um, so. Uh, this uh, some like you can build anything on that for sure. Yeah, we want to enable Web two use cases. We want to bring Web two use cases to Web three as well. Uh, but what, what's important here is we end up having uh, kind of three things. We have the development tool set, which is very specific in our case. Uh, I, I'll talk about it. Uh, so we have the network of nodes who anyone can can join and and run Fluence node and like execute this, whatever, create it with this development stack. And there is like the whole economics around that, like incentives for uh, for nodes to participate um, and stuff like that. Um, so two core components of it, uh, of the development stack is um, the WebAssembly runtime, which is works like sort of instead of Docker, instead of Docker, we run everything in WebAssembly. Uh, and the reason to have WebAssembly is 
not just because you can run it on any device, but uh, you know, uh, if you are the running node and you allow anyone to send a Docker container to you uh, with their program and you're gonna be like the hosting provider, uh, there are, like you would need to create additional um, you know, constraints for these Docker containers not to break your system, not to break your machine. Uh, and Wasm has much better isolation, so you can just have it out of the box. And it's kind of like super easy to become the hosting provider uh, at this sense. And um, like we, uh, we have our own runtime. Uh, it's based on Wasmer. It's pretty cool. It supports like whatever uh, WebAssembly standards exist. Um, we, uh, we have Mike here, but he's, uh, he left now, but he's probably gonna talk about this on Friday if you're interested at uh, um, IPFS and Wasm uh, track. Um, and the second, the second thing is um, Aqua, that we're also gonna have the track about this tomorrow. Um, it's a language that um, basically uh, you use to implement the control flow of your application. So when you build stuff on Fluence, you have the Wasm um, modules as a sort of Docker, like as a microservices sitting on different nodes, uh, wherever you, want, you deploy them. Um, and you have the orchestration, like business logic on top of these uh, Wasm containers uh, implemented in Aqua. Um, and, you know, some, some simple stupid analogy with Web2 Cloud that I have is like, you can think of Marine as sort of like Lambda functions. Uh, Aqua is sort of like workflows on top of Lambda functions, but Aqua is much more performant. It's um, like not just some JSONs or um, uh, configuration, but like the whole programming language that abstracts out a lot of peer-to-peer uh, -peer connectivity and, uh, uh, and things like that. Um, and it, it looks like very simple. So you, um, like if you wanna do some map reduce or like parallelization, it's just like few lines of code. Um, and yeah, Dmitry, I think Dmitry showed uh, this yesterday. Um, and what is cool here is that um, for basically every request that happens on the network, like user clicks a button, um, the Aqua VM creates sort of, um, you know, um, short-living uh, sub-network that executes uh, this request. So like um, all these nodes can, you know, know, can discover each other, can know about each other, can work together, can send like the some function like get price executed on one node and then the result sent to um, uh, to the uh, nodes that, that calculates uh, the average. Uh, and after the, you know, this script is executed, so request ends to in the uh, second device, uh, this subnetwork is, is not exist anymore. But you can also create the, you can use Aqua to program the long living subnetworks if you need the subnetwork to exist for a long period of time and like run some scheduled execution so you can also do this. So it's kind of very similar to what you have in the cloud where you have you know, cloud functions, they're triggered by events, they read data from some place, they write data into another place. Um, but this here you can also um, manage the workflow of the execution, the topology of the execution in terms of network. And in the cloud, you just don't see it. You don't know how it all works inside. Um, they just, it, it works like a black box. So yeah, again, like some pictures. So traditionally you have this centralized gateway that manage everything and kind of reroutes requests to different microservices or um, orchestrates business logic. Here you can like really decouple business logic to different nodes. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so this is Fluence Peer and we mainly try to focus on, on compute and not touch data, like every Fluence Peer by default comes with IPFS node, so you have like native access to IPFS data, uh, but potentially you can plug anything like any data source, um, so you can read from any data source. Uh, however, actually I, uh, I've spoken to some uh, Protocol Labs folks and uh, there's idea that, you know, uh, every day, like any data should live in IPFS. So we, we should always read from IPFS, even if it's like a blockchain data, it should be first dumped into IPFS. So like it should be like CID'd, right? And, and then like by CID using Fluence node, by CIDU, you should be able to retrieve 
any data and uh, you know, do some stuff on it and, and uh, put back to IPFS so like you have inputs and outputs all as, as CIDs. Um, and um, it's totally doable uh, and this is a pretty cool concept. Uh, but like right now by default, so you can just plug um, any data. Um, and yeah, we have Rust uh, implementation, JavaScript implementation. Uh, they're a little bit different, but uh, almost the same. <laughs> um, and yeah, and, and the, we have a few more components of it because um, when, we, um, when we think of, of um, you know, using this to implement, just re-implement something similar to traditional backends, um, we start having problems that we didn't have in centralized setup, like, you know, nodes reputation and stuff. Like, how, how should I select nodes? Where should I deploy my WebAssembly code? Um, if, I, if I don't know them, like, if they're all the same for me because I don't know any of them. That's why we have, for example, this trust graph thing, which is sort of web of trust uh, solution. So it's, it's a distributed database of um, trust relationships between nodes on the network. So now if I run the code, like the function, I should be able to uh, select nodes that I trust the most and, and deploy it there and execute there because, uh, because they're more trusted. And uh, the graph there is, it means that I can basically query um, if I, you know, I trust protocol apps and I know that protocol apps run some nodes, there are trust entries on the network from protocol apps to particular node instances. Um, so I can discover these nodes and see that I transitively trust can trust them because I trust this protocol app authority. But I can subjectively decide whichever authorities I trust. Um, so this basically allow, like this component basically allows me to manage wherever I execute the the code um, on a network. Uh, the registry thing is is about uh, having the metadata about subnetworks, basically like grouping the nodes uh, by giving them um, the ability to know that they work in the same group on some particular application. Um, so. Regarding Aqua, uh, basically because we are we are sort of decoupling the control flow from the execution in Wasm, uh, Aqua becomes the language to create distributed algorithms. So we can create like potentially anything, like uh, better Kademlia, like a different uh, you know modifications of Kademlia consensus uh, notifications, like whatever, like any um, any distributed algorithms. And this is what we kind of we see like for IPFS in particular, you can just use Aqua to uh, implement and re-implement um, IPFS, um, like parts of IPFS, like basically slices of IPFS. Um, you can potentially be able to create something like bit swap on Aqua or like something like uh, content routing or indexing um, and stuff like that. Like that. Um, so we, we kind of like pitching it because uh, we believe that uh, you can, in Aqua, you can implement this uh, algorithm once and then reuse across uh, different implementations in different languages like Go IPFS, Rust IPFS, like, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and a little bit on, on computation verification. Um, as I said, the whole idea was that, you know, we are not, we, we don't want to create a decentralized network that can compute stuff uh, and we don't want to force the consensus there, right? But if it's decentralized and anyone can join, anyone can provide any fake results to computations, right? How do you deal with this? So uh, there are basically only several ways to deal with it. Like first, you should trust node, and then for this, to select the most trusted node, uh, we have trust graph. Second, you can apply consensus partially to piece of computation that where you really, really need consensus. And you can you know, write the consensus algorithm in Aqua and apply it to uh, the, the WASM where you want to have consensus. Like basically you can implement something very simpler like collecting signatures for um, a computation result or you can have something more complex like tender mint or something. Um, and the third thing is basically some kind of ZK proofs but they, they really, really depend on the use case. They, uh, it's not really, I don't know if it's, if it's possible at all to have uh, ZK proof uh, for arbitrary computation that you would be able to uh, 
uh, create and verify at a um, reasonable amount of time. Um, but we don't have them yet. Uh, we're probably going to have it. Oh, and also there is a fourth way. Uh, some people uh, like to use TE, like a, a trusted uh, compute environments. Um, and you should be able to discover nodes that provide it or like a run fluence uh, with support of TE. Uh, but the problem, my personal concern about that is that uh, like Intel SGX was hacked a few times and there was like a silent attacks on it. So people created fake keys so they could have like really access to the computation that happens um, because they didn't have the, the T, they, they uh, pretended to have it. Um, so yeah, and you know, the network is, is heterogeneous. Basically every fluence node is different. Every fluence node has different amount of wasm, can, can execute different amount of wasms. Uh, so you can imagine the marketplace of, um, of services or kind of backends of applications or like a pieces of backends of applications. Uh, yeah, and I think the rest is, is less important, but uh, one cool thing here is uh, because like imagine that we run backends of applications uh, in such a network um, and uh, we talked in, in initially like in the beginning about API um, kind of dependency and, and platform risk. So uh, here uh, the same way as in blockchain because um, the author of the code doesn't run the code on the network. Like the, the, the hosting provider and the author of the code are two different um, people or companies. Um, now you can you know, have the sort of demand driven availability of the uh, backend components. So um, if I am as an application developer, I create the new version of the application and it's, you know, goes against uh, users' freedom or users' privacy and users don't like it, um, the hosting providers may just not update to it. So they you basically can have your application backend forked into two versions that, that would exist at the same time. And uh, like theoretically, users can uh, choose whatever uh, version they use. It's a, a lot more complexity to it, but the, the idea here is uh, same as on the blockchain, you can, once you deploy it stuff, it's there like forever if you uh, do it properly. Uh, and then you basically deploy, every time you deploy the new version of your smart contract uh, and they coexist and users decide uh, which is better. Um, yeah, and the economics is not yet there. So uh, not gonna talk about this uh, and uh, you can check out uh, the network all by our, our documentation and uh, come to our sessions to, <laughs> tomorrow. But that's it, yeah. Fair to say that right now you, and it's interesting when you said file system, that you are essentially treating IPFS just as a file system for now. Yeah, yeah, for now, well, a little bit more. So uh, it's a kind of file system, but also, for example, we use IPFS natively to deploy the WASMs to remote nodes. So like, you know, oh, nice. yeah, so like you, you, you upload it, you always upload it by default uh, to IPFS and then the node, remote node re retrieves it by, by CAD. Content but, addressable wasm. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And you can say that this is like sort of function, address, function addressability, but it's a, it's a complex also uh, question. Uh, uh, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Okay, thank you.